thank you uh, to you and uh, President Grimson, Alice Rogoff, uh, Ambassador Calpe. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you, and thank you to each of you in this room who has helped make this event possible. Uh, we're, we're very pleased to have uh, everyone here. Uh, and reflecting on the last panel uh, about the history of cooperation in the Arctic, um, I just have to share a short story of my own because at the end of the Cold War, uh, when I was serving in the Defense Department, U.S. Defense Department, I found myself leading a program called Arctic Military Environmental Cooperation uh, among the U.S., Norway, and Russia uh, at a time where all three of our countries and others um, who joined later Finland and the UK and a number of others were working to apply, uh, our, apply our knowledge, our scientific cooperation uh, among not only militaries but environmental and energy organizations in our countries to address challenges left by post-Cold War contamination in the Arctic region. And so um, it's, it's a pleasure to see that, that that collaboration and that spirit of cooperation can continue uh, to today. So we say what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Uh, as the last panel noted, climate change, of course, is the canary in the coal mine, or as a senator from Alaska has been known to say, the elephant in the igloo. So since our panel is the only uh, thing standing between you all and lunch, we're going to get right to it, and we're uh, there's no better group to address this challenge uh, than leading diplomats and parliamentarians from Korea, Singapore, and Norway. And since our Norwegian friend, I understand, has a uh, pressing engagement just following this, we're going to give um, uh, Mr. Sivertsen the chance to start us off. Thank you for that, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in these discussions. I think it's um, very important also that you have choose the headline, Russia and uh, the United States in, in the Arctic. As uh, chairman of the Arctic parliamentarians, representing all the Arctic countries and the European Parliament, I see it as important to be as inclusive as possible when talking about the Arctic. So I will base my views on the statement from the Conference of the Parliamentarians of the Arctic Regions from Ulan Ude in Russia last year. But I have to say, it's somewhat odd for me to speak in the session which is named A View from Outside the Arctic. Uh, myself be living in the city of Bode, uh, north of the Polar Circle, representing in this con uh, context all the people of the Arctic. Uh, but I will use the opportunity to uh, make a few points and comment upon a few points of perspectives or per the perception uh, I meet when I'm talking with people not living in the Arctic. So let me first comment upon the idea that the Arctic is a lawless wilderness or a last frontier. No, it isn't. As, as you as friends of the Arctic of course know this, but uh, this is a peaceful and a well-governed uh, area by the Arctic uh, countries uh, through international law. The UN Convention of Law of the Sea is the primary international agreement for governing the Arctic Ocean. The eight sovereign Arctic states have their obligations and their rights in accordance with international law. There's no need for an Arctic treaty, but there could be potential for uh, develop uh, existing uh, instruments. For an example, when we are discussing fisheries in the region. The second perception or perspective I often meet is about the knowledge of what is in the Arctic, what exists in the Arctic. When you travel around the world or uh, along the polar circle, meeting in conferences and seminars like this, uh, there's a lot of us doing uh, this in this uh, room, I see. We often see a lot of pictures of wonderful nature, animals and icebergs. But you rarely see pictures of humans, buildings or human activities. The point is, the Arctic is an inhabited area. There are about 4 million people living in the Arctic. Economic development and opportunities for the people living in the Arctic are vital in creating resilient and prosperous Arctic societies and better lives for the people living there. For who 
For us who are uh, the elected representatives of the people, the Arctic is first and foremost about the lives and the opportunities of the inhabitants in the Arctic. For us, it's of paramount importance to develop the societies and the uh, possibilities for the people there. The third is the perception about the Arctic, the one Arctic. I will argue that there is no such thing as one Arctic. It's huge differences between the American Arctic, the Russian Arctic, and the Nordic Arctic. One size will not fit all when we are discussing solution and future development of the Arctic. Norway has its ice-free harbors all year round and a well-developed infrastructure. For several years, it has been offshore operations in the Barents Sea, north of 71 degrees north. That is very different from the situation in the northern parts of Alaska. There are also big differences inside the countries. For an example, between the ways of life of Norwegians and the traditional ways of the Sami people in Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. The fourth is about the importance of protecting the Arctic. I am personally very eager to protect the Arctic. We see and feel the effects of the climate change taking place in the Arctic already today, in Alaska, in Greenland, and in Norway. Ice and permafrosts are melting and winds have already increased. Imagine if we currently face a global climate warming of three degrees elsewhere, the effect in the Arctic can be six to eight degrees Celsius. This is why emissions reductions promised in the, Pari in the Paris uh, Agreement is essential. Because it's not the four million people living in the Arctic alone that have created the climate changes. We'll take our part of the responsibility, but we do not solve the global, uh, global climate crisis by making the Arctic into a sanctuary. We will have to continue to address climate change, mitigation, as well as adaptation and to continue to build resilience in the Arctic. But to control the uh, global warning, we need a joint global effort. That will be the effective way to protect the Arctic, not by making the Arctic into a sanctuary. The fifth is about the non-existent race for resources. All the Arctic nations and the Arctic uh, Council has the goal to keep the Arctic as a peaceful and a stable region. And as the, the panel uh, here uh, earlier discussed, we are doing a good job in uh, that. And therefore, the Arctic Corporation should develop and strengthen it, uh, its economic agenda in cooperation with the business sector. There is a global attention on how the resources in the Arctic might be developed in a sustainable manner. Science, research, and cooperation will be important in making this happen. Non-renewable natural resources uh, development must be utilized to help build societies that last beyond the life of the resource. I believe it's time to also address Arctic innovation beyond the development of natural resources. What will the people living in the Arctic live of in, ad in addition to its rich natural resources? How do we stimulate innovation in the Arctic which addresses the needs of future Arctic societies? What can we learn from the sustainable lifestyles of the Arctic indigenous people? The Arctic Economic Council has been established uh, uh, and has set up a secretariat in Tromsø, Norway. From the Arctic parliamentarians' side, we have established good contacts with the representatives of the Council and its uh, former chair, Ms. Tara Sweeney. And we have co-hosted the Arctic De Economic Development Forum in Washington, D.C. in the beginning of April last year. And I uh, am looking forward to develop this cooperation with the new chair, Mr. Uh, Taro Avariosto. And I have to say in this uh, context that I'm very glad that in last week when we met in Aulu, I heard that uh, the Arctic Economic Council has endorsed the idea about the Arctic Investment Protocol. When we are de developing closer ties between the governments and the business sector, we should look to what already is in place. I believe that governments and businesses operating in the Arctic should use the international uh, corporate social uh, responsibility guidelines and find ways to implement them in the Arctic. Such instruments could be the UN Global Compact Initiative 
or as the Arctic Economic Council is arguing, the Arctic Investment Protocol presented by the World Economic Forum in January last year. I agree that we will have to invest in infrastructure to develop the, uh, the Arctic. And today I have heard argues, uh, people arguing to invest in ports. I agree in that and think it's important to uh, invest in ports also for the future. From the Norwegian side, I would like to mention that this week in the parliament, we had a big debate about uh, the national transport plan for the 12 years to come. And there we decided to invest about 400 million uh, Norwegian crowns in developing the harbor uh, in Longyearbyen at Svalbard. That will be an important hub, uh, uh, a logistic hub for uh, maritime activities in, uh, in the Arctic uh, uh, Ocean. I also will argue very strongly that we need to develop broadband telecommunications in the Arctic. Today, it's very hard to have communication at all, north of 73 degrees north. But if the future is digital, and it will be, then it also has to be a digital Arctic. So uh, the short version here is, get those satellites up and running mm -hmm. as fast as possible. The time for assessment is past. And uh, again, I will challenge the Arctic Economic Council to work with us parliamentarians uh, uh, in that. I will uh, end this by, uh, by mentioning something the Finnish ambassador was uh, uh, talking about. Because I agree that developing the Arctic is a political uh, question. And the Arctic Council has played an important role in the past 20 years. And I think the time has come for looking into what should the Arctic Council be in the future? How should we continue to develop the Arctic uh, Council? Therefore, the parliamentarians of the Arctic regions has been arguing and will support the Finnish uh, chairmanship in uh, arranging or uh, getting uh, a summit for heads of state into discussing how should we develop uh, the Arctic cooperation on the basis of the Arctic Council for the decades to, to come. I hope you all here will support us in getting this in place and in this hard and difficult political climate we have globally. I think it's especially important to lift it to that uh, level. And I'm looking forward uh, to uh, seeing the Finnish chairmanship succeeds in getting such a summit. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much. As a uh, Norwegian, certainly you have the view from inside the Arctic, but as an Arctic parliamentarian, you've well shared with us the view from outside. Next, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Ambassador Kim uh, of Korea, and I believe you have a presentation for us. Yeah. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, the, I, I should convey the, my thanks to uh, Wilson Center and uh, former uh, president, Iceland president, Mr. Grimson, for inviting this important forum. And it is great, uh, it is a great honor for me to be here to explain Korea's uh, Arctic policy and uh, activities. Korea's Arctic activities dated back in 1990s. The Dasan Arctic Science uh, Station was established uh, in Shibalbar in 2022, uh, 2002, and Korea built its first icebreak uh, research vessel, Arahon, in 2009. And Korea joined the Arctic Council as a permanent observer in 2013, along with Japan, China, and Singapore, and so on. Uh, in the same year, Korea joined the Arctic Circle. Uh, we uh, established our official policy on Arctic by adopting the first uh, Arctic uh, Polish master plan with the vision of uh, contributing to a sustainable future of Arctic. To implement the master plan, the detailed action plan was made every year, and we are now preparing the second master plan for the next five years. In addition, we are planning to build a second ice-breaking research vessels by 2022. 
and Korea has been actively uh, uh, participating. Yeah. Korea has been actively participating in uh, and making a contribution in activities in Arctic, Arctic Council, including its working groups and the task force. Korea holds bilateral uh, consultations with most of Arctic countries. This year, we will hold uh, bilateral consultations with Norway, Denmark, Russia, and Finland. Korea also participates in the international forums on the Arctic, including the Arctic Circle, uh, Arctic Frontier, and so on. In addition, Korea Maritime Institute, KMI, organizes Korea Arctic Academy every year. Since 2015, Korea has invited around 40 uh, Arctic indigenous stu students to Korea for this exchange program between Arctic and Korea students. And as for the Arctic research activities, Korea Polar Research Institute, COPRI, is the leading agency for the National Polar Research Program. COPRI is actively engaged in the scientific cooperation with the Arctic states and also uh, in international scientific collaborations through such as International Arctic uh, Science Committee and uh, Pacific uh, Arctic Group. Korea has been engaged in Arctic business, mainly in the fields of shipping and shipbuilding. Korea also has been participating in the negotiations on the high seas fisheries uh, in the Central Arctic Ocean. Now, Korea, uh, uh, so Arctic cooperation with the United States is mainly focused on the scientific research. Corporate has been collaborating with uh, such as NOAA and University of Alaska Fairbank and the U.S. Geological Survey and so on. Korea co-hosts the North Pacific Arctic Conference with East-West Center in Hawaii annually since 2011. And Korea's Arctic cooperation with Russia also focuses mainly on the scientific research. But it is true uh, that uh, both sides are looking at some possibilities to explore business opportunities, especially in the areas of shipping, ship area, uh, shipping, shipbuilding, and the national, natural resources. As for the scientific research, Corporate has been cooperating with the Shirishov Institute of Oceanology and the Russian Arc and Antarctic Research Institute. Uh, as for uh, business corporations, Korea Shipbuilding Company is building a total of 15 ice-breaking LNG carriers for Yamal project and delivered the first fleet uh, in March of this year. Yeah, from the Korea's experience in the Arctic for the purpose of uh, addressing the challenges we are facing in globally, I'd like to make four suggestions on Arctic activities. First, uh, Arctic should remain as a zone of peace. Uh, recently, military presence has been active in that area, and also tensions between Russia and the West over the Ukraine is one of the factors to impede international cooperation in the Arctic. In order to maintain the peace and stability in the Arctic, a strict rule-based international order should be applied in the region. Second, uh, non-Arctic states should play uh, constructive roles more actively and make meaningful contrib contributions to address Arctic issues. In this regard, uh, Korea as an, an observer state uh, in the Arctic Council shares the sense of responsibility with the Arctic states and has the willingness to increase it, our uh, contribution to deal with challenges we are facing in the Arctic. Third, observers have a, a limited right to participate in the activities of the Arctic Council. This reality uh, sometimes makes the observers feel frustrated. The area uh, where global addresses are necessary have been increased. In this regard, Korea appreciates the U.S. Initiative, initiative to engage observers under its Arctic Council chairmanship, and we hope that 
such engagement will continue and uh, be extended in the future. Lastly, uh, to a certain extent, a current governance system in the Arctic is a kind of a closed one. Uh, considering changing situation surrounding the Arctic for the last 20 years and the urgent need to address global challenges in Indonesia, the governance system of Arctic should become more open step by step based on the issue areas in the long-term perspectives. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. That was extremely well stated. Uh, now we turn to another important uh, partner and ally outside the Arctic. Uh, we're pleased to have the Deputy Chief of Mission from Singapore, uh, Ms. Cheryl Shum. Excellencies, fellow panelists, um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to everybody. Um, just wanted to first thank the Arctic Council and the Wilson Center for arranging this event on cooperation in the Arctic on a warm summer day in DC. Um, and um, thank you, of course, for inviting me to share Singapore's perspectives on the Arctic. Um, today, I'll just speak briefly about why we're interested in Arctic affairs and how we contribute um, to the Arctic Council. So Singapore applied for observer status at the Arctic Council in December 2011, and we were granted observer status in May 2013. And I understand it's not immediately obvious why Singapore, a small tropical country, um, located just one degree north of the equator and over 7,000 kilometers away from the Arctic Circle would be interested in developments in the Arctic or would even want to be an observer to the Arctic Council. But the truth is, despite our distance, Singapore is really quite connected to the Arctic because of climate change, global warming, and changing weather patterns. As a small, low-lying coastal nation, we want to better understand climate change and the impact of melting Arctic ice caps on Singapore. Much of Singapore lies only 15 meters above mean sea level. And about 30% of our country lies actually below five meters above sea level. So this makes us especially vulnerable to rising sea levels. If global temperatures rise, many parts of Singapore could eventually be submerged. We also want to better understand the implications and opportunities arising from a warmer Arctic. The opening of transarctic shipping lanes, especially the Northern Sea Route, can provide shorter alternatives to conventional routes between Europe and Asia that go through the Suez Canal and the Straits of Malacca. This development offers both uncertainties as well as opportunities for Singapore. Seaborne trade, of course, is Singapore's lifeblood. We are located on the Straits of Malacca, and our trade to GDP ratio is one of the highest in the world. Given our dependence on maritime trade, the opening of Arctic sea routes would naturally pique our interest. Singapore is also a maritime hub and one of the world's busiest ports, receiving about 120,000 vessels per year. Our marine industry has built up strong capabilities and credentials in shipbuilding and repair and offshore engineering. Hence, apart from a, des from a desire to study the impact of shifting sh shipping patterns on our status as a transshipment hub, we're also interested in exploring opportunities for our marine industries in the Arctic. Since the early 1990s, Singapore companies have possessed competencies in constructing ice-class vessels. In addition to being the first Asian shipyard to build icebreakers, Singapore's Keppel Group, the world's largest builder of offshore oil rigs, has also developed and refurbished rigs to operate in Arctic conditions. Since Singapore became an observer to the Arctic Council, we have been an active contributor to the sustainable development of the region. Where possible, we aim to work constructively with our friends in the Arctic in areas where we have experience and know-how and can add value. For instance, the Maritime Port Authority of Singapore has been an active participant in a number of working groups and task force, um, namely the protection of Arctic marine environment, emergency pre prevention, preparedness, and response, and also the ta task force on Arctic marine oil pollution prevention and Arctic marine cooperation. In these committees, we share Singapore's approach of interagency coordination and regional cooperation on dealing and managing oil spills. Singapore also recognizes that the Arctic indigenous people who have lived in the North for generations are crucial stakeholders in the region. Um, hence, we've established the Singapore Arctic Council Permanent Participants Cooperation Package, 
which is a technical assistance program customized in consultation with Arctic Council's Indigenous Peoples Secretariat to cater to the specific and current development needs of permanent participants. Under this package, we provide funding for representatives of the permanent participants to attend short-term courses in Singapore on various aspects of public administration. We also provide um, full scholarships for students from indigenous communities to pursue postgraduate studies in maritime law, public policy and administration, and maritime studies in Singapore. In addition, we've also hosted several study visits to Singapore for representatives of permanent participants. The next study visit will take place in early July and will focus on conservation and management of heritage sites, port management, tourism promotion, public administration, and multicultural policies. Finally, in line with the Arctic Council's objective of disseminating information, encouraging education and promoting interest in Arctic-related issues, Singapore has also sought to raise public awareness of the Arctic's importance both in Singapore and in our region through events, seminars, and workshops. Singapore hosted the Arctic Circle Singapore Forum in November 2015, which was the first of its kind in Asia. Um, President Grimson um, delivered a keynote address in this forum. We're very honored to have that. In August 2016, um, the National University of Singapore's Energy Studies Institute held a seminar called Energy Transitions and a Globalized Arctic with the support of the US Office of Naval Research. This seminar examined issues such as access to energy in remote locations and the governance of sustainable energy transitions. In January this year, with the support of the Royal Norwegian Embassy, we hosted the first Arctic Council event in Southeast Asia. This was the Arctic Migratory Bird Initiative Workshop. And we did this with CAF, the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna Working Group. This event was held at Singapore's Sungai Buloh Wet Wetland Reserve, which is home to more than 2,000 Arctic migratory birds from over 30 different species, including the Wimbrel and the Curlew Sandpiper, that they stop over um, in Singapore during the winter. The workshop brought together 96 experts from 25 countries to advance the work to improve the status and secure the long-term sustainability of declining migratory bird populations. Our research institutes in Singapore and our universities have also dedicated resources to research on Arctic-related issues. I hope that I've helped to explain a little bit about why Singapore regards the Arctic as a region of global importance and why we seek to contribute actively to its sustainable development. Moving forward, I hope we can continue to contribute to the work of the Arctic Council and the permanent participants, as well as in efforts in raising awareness of Arctic issues in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Well, that was a, an excellent uh, presentation and shows you the range of activities that our Asian uh, allies and partners are engaged with and how important their cooperation is uh, to the Arctic future. I see we have about five minutes, uh, so I'm gonna start out with um, a couple of, of questions and then we'll be happy to take any uh, if, there are some, if there are some before we break uh, for lunch. So I know just recently China, Japan, and Korea held their second trilateral Arctic dialogue. Um, and I wonder if um, both each of you could discuss uh, China's ev evolving role in the Arctic. I know that the, the Northern Sea Route was not initially included as part of what's known as the One Belt, One Road project. Um, but Beijing now appears to be developing it alongside uh, its other strands, and this could lead to as much as 15% of Chinese trade sailing through the Northern Sea Route by 2020, um, which could bring um, uh, even additional closer cooperation between China and Russia in this region. And I wondered if you could both uh, comment on how that uh, affects your views about evolving Arctic cooperation with, the, uh, with China. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, we, between Korea and China, we have um, a lot of the trade and a lot of you know, big relations uh, politically and um, there, there is uh, some areas also we have, uh, some areas we have cooperation, some areas we have conflict, uh, it's true. And uh, also if we add uh, in Japan, in that case, the more, more complicated situation we could face. Anyway, uh, 
Arctic is one of area the, between China and Korea to make a cooperate. Actually, the, we thought uh, it's the new areas, new frontiers of cooperation, or new uh, areas of diplomacy. The, as you mentioned, the, among three countries, Korea, China, Japan, we started the, uh, our uh, trilateral uh, Arctic dialogue. Its initiation was made by, our, by Korean side at the summit of 2015. Last year, the first meeting was held in Seoul, and the second meeting was uh, uh, held early this month in Japan. And next year, it is supposed to be hold, uh, held in China. I think uh, at this moment, uh, we think, uh, uh, we three countries think uh, uh, Arctic is uh, the area to cooperate uh, among other, among three countries. And also, we are now succeeded to regular, regular regularize to, um, uh, to hold the meetings. And third one is, uh, there, there is also, we have some uh, the homework. We should uh, extend our areas cooperations. It's one of, the, currently the cooperation area is uh, uh, limited in scientific, science and scientific researches, but uh, we should extend our cooperations in the education, communications, and uh, engagement to other the activities, so on and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, Singapore and China are, of course, very close, um, close relations, and China is a important trading partner of Singapore. It's our number one trading partner. Um, and we have uh, cooperated with China on a huge range of issues, on economic security. Um, and um, we are big supporters of the One Belt, One Road um, initiative as well. Um, <laughs> Not aware of any specific cooperation with China on the Arctic issues when we don't have a trilateral um, conference um, like Korea does, but um, I certainly see the opportunity for cooperation with China um, moving forward on this, these issues, both in the economic sphere, in research and scientific research, in um, even uh, technical cooperation. We can work with them on um, sustainable development issues and climate change issues. So I think um, really the sky's the limit there. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think I will uh, ask the, uh, if I see no one coming to the mic, I will ask the last question, then we will uh, head to lunch. Both of you spoke very eloquently uh, about the need to address climate change globally and particularly uh, in the Arctic and the research um, that is going on there. Uh, how, do you, how do you see the, both the Arctic Council and related institutions evolving to enable us not only to conduct the science, which we'll get into in depth in the uh, panels in the afternoon, uh, but the additional actions that are going to be needed to address the changing climate, sea level rise, ocean acidification, and other challenges uh, that we face uh, in this region. Okay, I'll take a stab at this. <laughs> Um, well, I think the Arctic Council, from what I know of it, has proven to be a good model of cooperation on many issues despite the possibly difficult um, political circumstances. And I think in difficult issues or in issues like climate change where I think a global, re a global response is necessary, um, I think it can serve as a model for cooperation. And it, it is in, indeed a, in a way a tip, at the tip of the spear because of uh, where it's located. Um, Singapore certainly is, remains very committed to the climate change agreement. Um, we are a low-lying coastal nation, and um, you know this is one of the reasons why we got involved in the Arctic Council. And um, you know we have been very encouraged by how the international community has responded, and I think we look forward to continuing to contribute to these global efforts. Well, let me, uh, I'm going to thank our panelists. I think we've shown that uh, we can continue the history of, uh, of significant cooperation in the Arctic uh, that has run now through both the nuclear age and into the climate era. And if that's one of the evolving themes uh, of this conference, and I think we will have all done uh, a service, uh, not only in the Arctic, uh, but globally. And let me also, just as we close out, I would like everyone to thank the, the extraordinary Wilson team that's been working behind the scenes to make this day successful uh, for all of you. Thank you.